Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 94 of the No Clip Podcast. It's another bonus episode, folks. I don't know what keeps happening. We keep just having cool people who want to chat, and then we still want to do our regular podcast this week, that week, but we don't want to... We don't want to shorten it and we don't want to, you know, take time off the interview. So we just do both. We just indulge ourselves. We just talk to people about video games. Uh, and this one's a really, um, a really special one for me because uh, the person I interviewed today, Dominic Diamond, that name is either going to make your ears pick up immediately or you're going to be like, who? <laughs> Depending on... Uh, what side of the Atlantic uh, you grew up on. Um, although you could argue, if you listen to radio in Canada, you may also know this person's name. Uh, Games Master was a TV show in the 90s that was really just uh, the first through the wall. It was a groundbreaking TV show for kids about video games. Uh, it ran for seven seasons. Um, each season was a different like setup. It looked different. They swapped out hosts at one stage. It had a... A floating head of a famous physicist giving cheat codes or astrophysicist. It was uh, just a crazy, weird, creative, uh, totally bespoke, idiosyncratic show. And people loved it. It's a cultural force. Uh, they tried to reboot it um, a couple of years ago or last year or something. Um, but Games Master is iconic in the way that, you know, over in the States here, I'm sure stuff like, you know, G4 you know, is similarly sort of that way, but obviously from an earlier era. So why am I talking about Games Master? Well, Dominic Diamond, who is my guest today on the No Clip podcast, he was the host for most of the series of Games Master. He was in for six of the seven, and he is quite an icon himself within the world of uh, British, you know, video games coverage, but also just British television uh, writ large. Um, he has written uh, a book called Games Master, The Oral History, with the help of Thames and Hudson. They had a whole team working on this. Uh, Darren Wall is a, a guy uh, I have uh, kept in uh, professional contact with over the years. Professional contact makes it sound like he's like a hitman or something. Um, uh, he ran a company called... Uh, ROM, Read Only Memories. They produced some of my favorite video game books ever. They did the Sensible Software one. They did the Bitmap Brothers one. They did Britsoft. Absolutely loads of these great ones. Um, uh, from my understanding, Thames and Hudson is sort of like either merged or bought that company. I'm not quite sure, but I know Darren was instrumental in getting this whole thing set up and published and everything. So um, when he told me about the project, I was super excited about it. And then when the publisher separately reached out to me about it, I was like, can we get Dominic on the podcast? I would love to read this book and talk to him. So that's what I did. Uh, for my, uh, you know, I'm not a book reviewer. I don't read all that much, uh, I burned through this thing. I absolutely loved it. Um, it is, uh, if you've ever read any of the ROM books, they're very different to, it's not just like pages and pages of text. Uh, it's lots of interviews interspliced. The setup of the pages, you know, it's sort of, there's, there's you know, there's pictures for dum-dums like me. Um, but, it, you know, it's sort of like Dominic Diamond doing a lot of the, uh, the, the introducing to each season. And then it'll sort of like have like a block or a paragraph that's um, from one of the producers on the show, one of the, you know, editors, the folks who did the uh, set dressing. It, for someone like me who's interested in not just in games preservation, but in like video production, I could not put the thing down. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So we tried not to get him to, uh, you know, just, I guess, repeat all the anecdotes that are in this book, because that would, you know kind of be pointless. I talked to him about the book, about the process of making a bit about what Games Master means to him now that he's in his 50s, uh, about what he thinks about games coverage these days and Twitch and the new Games Master and all this sort of stuff. Uh, it was a lovely conversation and I hope you really like it. And before we get to it, I just want to say thank you to all of our amazing title sponsors here at Patreon, no, uh, patreon.com slash noclip. Uh, Jason Drury, welcome to the, the squad. Cody Krieger, Forrest Pruitt, Andy Fagan, Cameron Ladd, George Dakotas, Jacob Godserve, and Tohir Tiliav. All of you terrific, wonderful people. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, thank you for listening to the podcast or watching. If you're watching here on YouTube, this whole thing was on camera as well. So if you're listening to this, you could be looking at one, you know, uh, older Scottish gentleman and one older, it's not as old, but still older uh, Irish gentleman. Celtic warriors, the two of us. All right, enough from this old Irishman. Listen to the Scotsman. This is my uh, interview with Dominic Diamond.
Dominic, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, my first question, I think, is, you know, was this a part of your life that you were eager to revisit? Because I can imagine that it's a quite an important part of your life. But you know, as you, as I got from reading the book, it's heavy. You know, it's it it it, it casts a long shadow. Yeah, it's funny because I did when we started writing the book, I didn't know how heavy it was going to get. So I, I didn't have a problem when we started writing it. I was like, all right, this will be fun. I'll just do like a nice little romp through uh, the most fun decade that any of us ever had. <laughs> and there'll be lots of great anecdotes and tales behind the scenes. And so it was thanks to the editor, Jack Templeton, who basically took my initial efforts and threw them right back at me and was like, no, all you're doing here is making funny gags and doing double entendres and knob gags. And, and I said, yeah, that's kind of, that's what the show was. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, but as a fan, and, and Jack, the editor, started off as the original Games Master Uber fan. He had the first website dedicated to the show. He said, no, no. He said, I want this to be the definitive story of what I didn't know. I want to know what you were feeling behind all those jokes, behind all that stuff. What was it like to go from being um, a complete unknown and being propelled to like the, the front of one of the biggest shows of the 90s and also the de facto face of an entire industry that was coming up. What did that do to you? And that's uh, and that's when it started to get heavy. It's, it's interesting to hear that because the thing that drips from this book for me is the sort of the honesty, uh, culpability a lot of the times from you or, or, or even like revisiting... Um, relationships that you had within you know that sort of creative workforce mm. that were stra stressed and strained at yes. times um so was it a process to get down to that to get down to the bone on some of that sort of stuff yeah it was it was i think it's difficult because you want to tread a fine line between telling a funny tale about something that people remember and that's a positive <laughs> influence in their lives and and uh, and also saying look okay at the time i was doing a lot of drugs I went a bit mad. It kind of triggered off anxieties, depressions, insecurities. I, I wasn't at times the best person to be around with other people because I was um, I was extremely uh, I cared so much about Games Master, and I was in a very rare position that that someone gets put in, especially at that age, where you are in complete charge of a massive TV show. And certainly after when I came back for Series Four, after not doing Series Three every single thing went through me and I was very much a control freak and very much a perfectionist. So it was, um, yeah, I think there was a lot of times where I maybe could could have been more uh, um, aware of other people rather than my mission. No, this is what we're going to do. This is what the show's going to be. This is how great it's going to be, you know? So I'm very conscious of not just like repeating anecdotes in the book or spoiling it. I've had a terrific time reading it. Um, Thank you. From a you know fan of the show perspective, obviously, uh, from somebody who works in you know video production, I find it absolutely fascinating. The amount of you know even mentioning like the motion graphics crew, like they get a nod. You talk about editing in it, you know, uh, production, set dressing, all that sort of stuff. There's so much technical. Um, stuff in here too and then as somebody who worked in I worked in the um, games industry in the UK in like the 2000, 2006 2011 through mm -hmm. there in London and even the the, the sort of vibes of, I've I'd heard about the mad old days and but to actually hear the stories was super interesting um you know it, it's a fairly like widely cast net like it covers a lot um was that always the case do you think like when you imagined what this book was going to be when you sat down for that first draft um, obviously, it's been split up very smartly into the different seasons and uh, sort of uh, is mostly your recollection of it. And then there's obviously lots of interviews from other people as well tossed in there. Um, was that format, you know, what you thought it would end up being like? Because obviously you 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 did another, you have your, your own memoir as well, uh, Celtic and Me, Confessions from the Jungle, which presumably doesn't follow that format. Uh, no, that well, it was an inter no, it doesn't. No, because the Celtic and me is just it's just me, and uh, it's an interesting similarity between the two books in that uh, Celtic and me kind of mirrors my my life as a Celtic fan. Again, being propelled into this um, position of, of being the celebrity Celtic fan that I, I never asked for. It's just what happens. <laughs> and then comparing that to like my my media career and, and uh, how it was going at the same time. And uh, so yeah, who, I think who does Billy Connolly support? Billy Connolly sports Celtic. 
okay. sometimes he'll say well. Partick, but uh, but he is he is, as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, he's a, he's a Celtic fan. But no, it was um, it, I would love to claim credit for the format of the Games Master book, but it was Jack Templeton, the editor, and, and he said, "I want to tell the whole story, and I want to tell it from everybody that's in, involved." He'd spoken to a lot of people on the show over the years, and he knew there was a lot of us who were still friends and still kept in touch. And he was like, this was such an amazing experience, not just for you, Don, but for everybody involved. So many people who started off on Games Master went on to do massive things in, in, in TV. And this was the first job that they all had. And this was the critical to the success of Games Master and that we had this amazing mum, Jane Hewland, who basically uh, gave jobs to all these people who were not nearly experienced enough to be producing, directing, uh, presenting, researching on television, and just was like, right, I'm going to give you the chance because there's something about you. In most cases, it was that they were funny or that they had a bit of an individual personality. And she was like, I'm not going to go down the conventional TV route of getting someone who's maybe you know, a bit bored and kind of, you know, has done lots of TV stuff. No, let's bring people in that are fresh. And, and so that's why it was such an original TV show. And that's why people then went on to use that as their calling card and, and go on to do lots of other things. So it was really good to get them all together. And it was quite... I quite liked the fact that I wasn't the only one who felt that they were ridiculously spoiled uh, for, <laughs> for their first media job, that everyone else was like, yeah we all kind of thought that's what it would be like working in the media forever. And sadly, it's not. You don't have that level of control. You don't have that level of fun. You don't have that sandbox that we had. So while it was a, an incredible opportunity for me, it really did ruin and has ruined the rest the rest of my, of my media career because I got so used to always being in control. And then when you go on to do other things and you don't have that control, that's very hard. Yeah, I was I was about to ask because it's a story you you do hear sometimes with like, you know, child actors who had a particularly long run on a television show maybe or uh, yeah, in your case obviously a, a defining TV program not just for yourself but for, you know, games and for television. Um I guess could you have written this book 10 years ago? Like, how long did it take for you to sort of, you know, you obviously had a, a successful a, a career at XFM in Scotland. You now live in, in uh, Canada or, well, New Scotland, I guess. Um, so you, you've you've obviously, like, developed and enjoyed a career since. But was it more difficult to revisit this? Was it, I guess, was it easier now in, you know, 2020, whenever you put pen to paper, than it would have been maybe 10 years prior? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I think that there's there's a bit of a kind of myth that kind of kind of grew up around Games Master. That um, sorry, I'll start again. That there's there's a kind of myth that grew up around Games Master afterwards was that I didn't like to talk about it, and I don't. That I don't ever feel aware that that was the case. I mean, yeah, sometimes if you get you know people every week asking questions about the shows in your Twitter inbox, you're like, look, you know, just <laughs> uh, can I get back to you later. But um, but no, it wasn't. I, I don't think it was. There was ever a time where I felt I had to be ready to talk about. It. I mean, we were coming up to the thirtieth anniversary. That seemed good, um, and I just. I think also there seemed to be a general wave of of retro gaming coming back. Anyway, it seemed that people's eyes were glancing back towards there, and I think that that is um, possibly because of the the state that gaming is in. You know, and and today in the, the last couple of years, I think it's in a, a pretty kind of cold, cynical, joyless, manipulative, exploitative state just now with microtransactions and games being released unfinished. And I think that there was a lot of people who watched Games Master who were, you know, kind of in their 30s or even 40s who kind of started looking back to the 90s when games were released finished. And there was like, you know, there was eight new games a month. And you could, all right, you could find, you could pick and choose. Not this kind of bombardment and uh, and this kind of incessant updates and things you had to be constantly connected to the internet. And I think everybody was feeling a little bit lost and discombobulated, the people of the Games Master generation. And that's what I tapped into a year ago when I started writing for The Guardian as well. It was exactly that. It was my own kind of feelings as a as a gaming dad go looking at games today and, and, and just going, oh my God, it does my head. And so I kind of feel that that's what we felt was was right. We felt people were looking back with a nostalgic glow towards that time. And, and this was a good time to tell them the story of the show that started their love affair with video games. 
It's interesting to hear you talk about that because I know also during COVID, uh, you, like many people, dipped your toe into the world of Twitch. Oh, um, yeah. uh, but how, how was that experience? You know, talk about how uh, how video game you know media has changed over the past thirty years. It, it, it was interesting uh, because I, uh, I I came into Twitch because it was an old radio boss of mine in Canada who'd gone down to uh, the US and was charged by Twitch of getting like radio presenters onto Twitch. So I came at it from a kind of radio point of view, a talk radio point of view. But then, of course, the, all these people who were signing up were like, oh, you know, you need, you need to be doing game run-throughs and everything. And I I didn't, I didn't, tried that a couple of times, Danny, but I didn't enjoy it because I felt, and I still don't know how people do it. Well, I know the answer is they don't do it very well. It's that I, I love the one-on-one communication with Twitch via the chat room, but you can't communicate with someone while you're concentrating on playing a game. Mm-hmm. And I would rather communicate with people i mean that's kind of that's why i gravitated towards radio because that's that's my kind of thing i'm a communicator and a storyteller so i struggled with that aspect of twitch of people coming on expecting me to speed run something on call of duty (laughs) when in fact i I was really just wanting to talk about like what people's favorite dinosaurs were or uh, or kind of you know things like that but then in a lot of ways that that was that was the key to Games Master in a lot of ways was that we weren't slavishly dedicated to the video games industry or video game jargon or anything. We were quite mm. surreal and we, you know, we had obsessions with things like like underpants and cheese and things like that. So, you know, and that's what helped Games Master become a mainstream success rather than just a niche video games TV show, which was the danger it could always have been, but but it wasn't. Yeah, and it's funny, like in the years afterwards, you know, I was I was born in 86, so I was fairly young watching Games Master with my brother. And then I remember being in my teens and, and growing up and, and seeing a lot of uh, sort of uh, people trying to emulate that show, but doing it in a sort of cleaner, more video gamey way. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the most amazing and, and timeless aspects of Games Master is the production design, the sets, the, the fact that it like changed genre you know uh and look every year and that patrick moore had a new headgear and that you had a a new a new jacket which you get into the jacket in the book of course um what was really cool about the book was reading the sort of pragmatic reasons behind a lot of that stuff like oh we can't use this church next year or you know uh, your comeback in season four after um, uh, Dexter Fletcher's run, uh, you know, being in hell and, and referencing what they had said about the jacket and all that sort of yeah. stuff. It's it's so cool to see the other side of uh, something, a myth that you had basically told yourself yeah. as a viewer and as a child for years. Um, yeah. It was it was it was great though because Jane always I think it was Jane who, whose idea was that we wanted to the video games were always about different levels you finish one level you go into a completely different level one level you be in the jungle the next level you be in space so there was so that was definitely something that she wanted to do but yeah but a few times it was happy accidents and that we couldn't return to places that we'd we'd filmed uh, previously but it was definitely that. Um, that level of ambition was another one of the keys to its success because it, it didn't just mark it out as 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 a kind of show that was more colourful or or a kind of that we cared more about than other TV shows. It wasn't TV by the numbers, but also it it, create, it was so good at creating a completely different world. This wasn't just a TV show. This was a world that kids could escape into. Um, and one of the most incredible things that I I heard. When, uh, when we launched the Kickstarter for the book originally and, and hearing from a lot of people was how many kids had uh, felt uh, estranged or disenfranchised from their peers at school because they were geeks, because they yeah. were video game fans, because they weren't in the sports teams or in that, and they were getting bullied and they didn't have many friends. Uh, but they had this show and it was the first time they felt they had a world that they belonged to and and they could escape into that and then through that they would go to school and that other kid that maybe hadn't wasn't in the sports team that didn't talk to anyone they would have something to bond with them and groups formed and that to me is is the the legacy that i'm the most proud of was that that we gave you know disenfranchised estranged kids that that weren't classically popular that we gave them something to belong to and and that's uh, i get quite I kind of get quite emotional talking to them about things like that. Having kids myself and, you know, having a, right. like, like what one of my kids on the autism spectrum and having seen him go through that kind of estrangement at school and not being a conventionally popular child. I'm so proud that we did something that helped unconventionally 
popular children have something to, to become, you know, to, to get a group through. Yeah, it certainly felt like at the time that you had also, you were legitimizing video games because of its position on Channel 4, because of, you know, not just the ratings, but the fact that it it seemed like there was effort behind this show. Mm. And, and obviously, you know, like you said, kids came to it kind of like a church, you know, it was it was their um, their their weekly sermon to watch uh, to watch Games Master and see what was going on. Yeah. Um, you know. When you look back, I guess, when you were going through the process of reading the book, did you have any moments of self-discovery yourself? Because obviously the format of the book is sort of you as the narrator sort of telling your version of what's going on. And then there are these um, interviews or, or or even older interview segments, for instance, with uh, Sir Patrick Moore, um, sort of inserted into it. And then sometimes you actually reference the interview that has been inserted and kind of go oh that's something i didn't know what, what was what was that process like and was there stuff that you have sort of like come to understand or get a different perspective on through the process of writing the book yeah it was interesting there was uh, there's some bits by uh, drogo michi who was our set designer for series four through seven he was just an absolute genius of a man and there's a couple of things he wrote that was kind of quite not i mean not unkind but not not I mean, I wouldn't even say caustic, but about my level of control freakery and and the, and how nobody dared tell me anything contrary to what I believed. Now, I wasn't aware of that so much at the time because we were all just mates and we were all having a laugh. And, I, and, and you know, one of the things about life is one never knows what anyone says when you're not there about you. And that's what's great about a book like this is that when you when they are allowed that chance... Um, so it was it was interesting because um, I uh, I wasn't aware, you know, that people kind of it was a it was a little bit like oh sh you know maybe there was stuff we could have done differently maybe somebody would have had a better idea than I had and and oh did, did I let people have their say that I let them come up with with enough ideas but. Um, I mean, nobody complained about the final product. So I get, you know, I get, and by the same token is that, you know, everybody says in the book it was the best fun that they ever had, you know, in their lives. But there was definitely a, um, there was definitely a, you were either in my gang or not right. in my gang. And there was obviously a very, you know, famous example of that, which is which is Dave Perry, and, and which unfortunately led to a catastrophic breakdown in their relationship, which played out on screen, uh, given the show, it's, you know, it's probably its most played, most remembered moment. And uh, right. uh, where it was for people who don't know, there was a, a Dave started off as one of the original uh, uh, members of the team responsible for a lot of the great creative ideas. Um, we were really good friends. He was an original co-commentator. But as I decided that we had to take the games industry less and less seriously and not be controlled by them, Dave had decided to go the other way and and take gaming and his gaming prowess very seriously. And so we ended up in a bit of a schism that got wider and wider. Um, and then eventually when we had a games challenge on the show and it didn't work out that way for Dave, it completely exploded. And I wish that I had, I wish I'd corrected that schism. I wish I'd been more open to being aware of it. But then that's, you know, I was off on my own kind of thing. I was also doing, you know, drugs at the time and I wasn't um I wasn't really listening to to a lot of people so yeah I felt a bit sad about that because that's something that's followed Dave around you know for for the rest of his life uh, and it's a shame that that turned out the way it did I, I mean Dave's not blameless himself you know um the you know he decided to create this character the, the game's animal and 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 market it and everything so uh, and it's a tricky thing to pull off but I wish that um yeah, well, I wish that hadn't quite happened to the mm. degree of schism it did. And he's in the book, of course, as well. Yeah, um, you know, th throughout it, and then his thoughts and 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 comments on everything that happened. Um, it is interesting the amount of people who uh, are in here, like even to the point. I think I'm trying to think of some of the more more strange ones. I'm not sure if there's a quote from Vic Reeves in here. I know yeah, yeah. Zig and Vic's Zag have Vic's in yeah, it. Zig and Zag's in it. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, 
Yeah, that was that was one of the there were so many lovely things that I was able to do as a result of the show. And I remember I had gone on to the big breakfast and being interviewed by Zig and Zag. And it was very strange. It was the first time I'd ever been interviewed by spoiler alert and um, puppets that weren't real. So it was very strange. Hey mate, look, I grew up in Ireland. They yeah, are there. That they're you royalty. Know, you don't yeah. don't don't say that to me. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. They, um, but it was so <laughs> interesting. When you go in first of all and you see the guys, but then when it starts, you just see zig and zag and it's completely real and it's quite incredible that's the power of mm. of a the medium but also the power of the performers as well it was really that was really cool that was uh, that was that was great there was a lot of great things i managed to do that was uh, that was up there with it with the best of them and and then and we also got robbie williams to do the forward which was a wonderful surprise uh and i was i was absolutely stunned and bowled over when when he agreed to do that because i just reached out to him I, yeah i just reached out to him i just sent a letter to his agent and then Woke up a couple of days later and there's an email from Robbie Williams in my inbox. Uh, so it was uh, things like that. All these years later are mm. still amazing. And that's the, the testament to the kind of, you know, the strength of the show and the legacy. Yeah. And I won't spoil it, of course, but it just even to having him talking that, that forward about you, how much it means to him and how that's even like mirrored in his in his house is really yeah. Uh, something cool um i want to ask a selfish question because here on noclip where you know we make documentaries about video games development mm. we love games media we love games development but we don't um we, we we love talking about production video production a lot but we don't often have an avenue to do it um i was very lucky to grow up in the world of digital editing um i have to ask you what was it like putting this show together especially on some of the seasons where you had dozens of episodes yeah. you know multi-cam shoots yeah uh, all working off the tape like you know how much of your time working on games master was actually just stuck in an edit suite well on series two i, I was an uh, associate producer and i was very I, I was determined to get involved in all that stuff behind the scenes because when i appeared on a, a big breakfast report with chris evans and he turned up and it was to do with the comic relief game Sleepwalker. And I saw him and he was telling the cameraman, the angle to do that. He controlled every single part. And I'm like, that's what you got to do. You got to be in control of everything. And because I'd been made to wear a red jacket, which I wasn't happy with. And I saw, right, this is how you do it. So I really wanted to do more production site. What a horrible kind of way to have to learn, like thrown in at the deep end. So you would basically have like tapes of what you'd shot in the studio and then tapes of different levels of graphics, and then you had to bounce them off. So you had to like take a tape and a tape, edit them, bounce that off into another tape, take that composite, put it back in, bounce it off another one, and you had to oh add. Boy. It was like it was like building Lego blocks. You had to layers and layers, and you could only do so many because you had degradation of quality all the time, nice. which you don't have in digital lossless video editing now. So yeah, and it took absolutely forever. So all those, um, like the review sections where we had graphics coming in and out and Patrick Moore's oh, no. face and then blue screen and then people appearing on blue screen would take like, you know, seven seven passes just to get that right. And then for some reason, I still can't understand how this worked, that they had to be done in with black, just dark, and then the graphics had to be put on. And then what, what, what I did though, Danny, was that I got a little bit... Um, the kind of a lot of the books about the addict side of me, I got completely addicted to that. So the minute I was in there and the minute I saw blue screen and what you could do was I would go a bit mad. And then I would add like, there was one thing, I think it was video game and grannies or something where I had like about four shots, one on top of the other, like on top of all the stuff. And it made it virtually unwatchable, but I was just like, <laughs> Oh, how far can we, can we make this? So yeah, it took, it took for, ever to edit each show it took an extraordinarily long time madness um uh, patrick Moore, obviously uh you know he's he's he uh, hasn't been with us for a while now so obviously can't couldn't get new quotes from him or no. anything but um he's mentioned uh from an older i believe interviews in the 90s and um and he's in there as well which is great um it's all the stories involving him sound so funny because people keep mentioning his politics as yeah. if like i love the guy but he's kind of a you know he kind yeah. of sees the world in an old way and and his favorite his favorite curry shop down the road from the yeah. uh the voiceover booth uh yeah what type of guy was he like because obviously even the story of how he got involved and he was giving his money to charity and he thought it was just a regional thing it's also sweet and quaint it is it is and, and it's, it's difficult because I, I guess i'm i'm lucky in that i only met patrick once and it was right oh, at the that's, end it was, that's the, even that revelation in the book is crazy it's yeah and it was the last literally the last day of filming 
And and I, I mean, I'm quite I'm kind of quite regretful. I kind of look back and think I I didn't realise really until we started writing the book how much we were perceived as a as a genuine double act. I never thought of us as being almost like a right. comic double act, but we never we only met the one time. So I kind of I'm not sure how we would have. Um, hung out really because I was, you know, going out to parties and getting absolutely cane. I'm not really sure what Patrick would have done there, but I'm kind of quite pleased that I I wasn't subjected to Patrick's political beliefs because I would have hated to have fallen out with him, which I would have done because mine are at the uh, opposite side. And then and then what would have happened then? I, you know, there would have been a massive split on the show. But at the same time, he was. Um, I'm not excusing his politics. He was utterly incredible at that job from for somebody who didn't know anything about video games and never did he nailed the delivery from show one he very rarely needed a retake and i, I again i'm quite candid in the in the book about how terrible i think my presenting is for the first series and the second series really i think it's i think it's not very good at all i, I can't watch a lot of series two um, but Patrick, when I, it took me a, a few years to find my natural presenting feet, Patrick just got it like from the off. So he was a he was a a very uh, an, a, an interesting human being. Uh, you know, you talk in the book about your return uh, for season four, and um, I loved all the sort of um, you know humility and and sort of empathy you had for Dexter Fletcher, mm. um, who's obviously as well you know had a terrific career uh, since as well um but and and his candidness in in talking about just how tricky it is to spin all the the plates and and yeah. and to obviously know the lingo and all that sort of stuff and um, i have to ask you you know without, without again i don't want to spoil too much of the book w- what was your favorite series if you go back and and look at the all the series you were involved in what was the one that you think um you're most proud of well do you know what there's there's there's, there's two answers to that and one's got to do with the book uh, my my favorite series uh, was was series seven was the last series because it was the one that you know we only did because Channel Four forgot to cancel it. We told them that we were only doing six <laughs> series, so it was uh, quite incredible to be told like you know four to six weeks before you're due to air that you're doing a TV series that you all thought that you had gone off and done other things. So it's quite amazing that we managed to pull that off. But that was just like that was like a bonus level in a game. That was like a post credits sequence in a movie it was another chance for us all just to hang out again and there was no pressure on us at all we didn't have to worry about ratings we didn't have to worry about anything it was just (laughs) absolute pure unadulterated selfish fun and we got some really good tv out of it my favorite part of the book though for the reasons that you said is series three because that's the one I knew the least about. I mean, I knew anecdotally about the chaos that was happening behind the scenes at the time, but I, I was also so consumed with rage and bitterness against the show. Um, <laughs> and I wanted it to fail. But again, over the ensuing years, when I have just seen just the, the horrific, you know, it's online, the internet and online commenting has been such a horrible, horrible development for this world that I just see the fact that even Dexter Fletcher, who has gone on to become a, a Hollywood director of incredible skill and achievement, will still get people slagging him off for not not being great on this video games TV show still now. And I am, um, and I didn't realise until we were writing the book the effect that that had on Dexter on on him mentally. And it was really because he was young at the time and and. It was his first quote-unquote failure. And it was horrible and it was brutal. And it wasn't his fault, Danny. Mm. There was 99 things going wrong behind the scenes. The whole team had left. There was new producers, new directors. But Dexter was the one guy who has to stand in front of a camera. He has to carry the can. And that is such a shame that he's the one that's had to carry it. But... He's done all right, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's I say, you know, you reference in the book that him and and uh, David Perry or Dave Perry. Although you do have David Perry in there too, you managed to get both Tom Perrys, Shiny, yeah. which I yeah I couldn't. But it was and you know, uh, fame probably Northern Ireland's most famous developer. Um, uh, yeah, it was it was great to see the uh, the sort of um, yeah you talked because legacy is obviously an important part of this. Uh, you know, it's uh, what I like to think of most about the book is that I, it doesn't ever reduce itself down to pure sort of nostalgia. Fun. Like there's mm. there's 
was great grit in here and great meat. Uh, before you go, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the 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 new Games Master. Did you get a chance to see much of that? Uh, hosted by uh, a fellow Scott as well and Rob Florence and a bunch of folks um, from the UK video games uh, press scene. Um, what did you make of it yourself? Have you seen much of it? I, I'm sorry to give a very disappointing answer, but uh, nope. Didn't see one second. Um, made a decision not to watch one second because I, uh, I I like I like Rab Florence. I go back a ways with him. I think he's an incredibly talented guy, and he's a, he's a he's a really good guy. He's a good human being, and so I didn't want to um, have an opinion on it that would right. either be negative and that that would be connotated in any way being against Rab or even be misconstrued as negative. So I decided the best thing was was that no, I did not watch. I didn't watch one second. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I just I would you know it it, it was what it was. It, the rate didn't do didn't make great numbers. Um, I uh, yeah, I mean it's a shame. It's it's a shame. Uh, it's a great shame that you know we had it. We had a really good show and we did really well. And people who own the rights made certain decisions and decided to go mm. certain ways. Uh, there was one time before in the history of Games Master where they tried to make a series without me <laughs> and they decided to try and repeat history and history repeated itself. It's uh, it, We've seen it repeated over here as well in the US with G4 where they tried to bring it back recently under a different way. And it just, it, I, it, I feel in many ways it shows just how, how different the world of games coverage is now i guess my last question to ask you is you you know you've you know music is a great love of yours obviously radio is a huge love of yours uh you've dipped your toe in the world of twitch uh you're a published author on on a uh, i suspect will be a fairly popular um uh, book about the old days as well uh, is there any part of you that wishes to do a little bit more work in games obviously you mentioned your guardian column as well mm. um you know uh do you still is there anything about modern games that you enjoy or or do you find yourself sort of wistfully thinking back whenever you put pen to paper no 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 i very i very much uh i i basically it was um the, uh, I'd, I'd never stopped playing games and, and all my kids are all gamers but what i'd found over the years is that my gaming got more and more narrow and it was basically a horrible obsession with fifa ultimate team that i would spend <laughs> hours and hours and hours every week uh, and i would just you've, get filled you've with... not gone into death though You're oh, okay not, no not because of that luckily um but and i just got full of so much self-loathing and, and realizing that i was complicit in such a toxic online uh gaming environment and also such a horribly cynical way of uh, hoovering up money from other people right. and so uh, finally i kind of put on my big boy pants and wrote a piece about it for the guardian and i'd said in that piece that I, was, I wasn't going to get FIFA 22 and instead I was going to play all these games that my kids had been recommending to me over the years that I hadn't. So then that's kind of what the Guardian column became about, was this kind of adventures of a modern dad gamer trying to kind of, you know, tread his way through, you know, the last 10, 10 years of gaming that he's missed out on through a stupid, slavish addiction to FIFA Ultimate Team. And then what I found was that I, I, I didn't have enough... Uh, I didn't have enough columns. I got one column once in the Guardian. I wanted to write more about it. So I started a thing on Substack, Dominic's little old purple column, because we had Dominic's big purple column in Games Master Magazine. And I do that once a week now, and I love it. And that is basically, it's a kind of twofold thing. It's part of it is me having a nostalgic look back at the games that, you know, we played in the 90s and we loved and some of the games that were on Games Master, and even going right back to my, my real gaming origins, which was ZX Spectrum and arcade games of the 70s coupled with my increasingly angsty attempts to navigate modern gaming, which which genuinely, at the moment, I'm trying to find relaxing games because I just, I find the whole modern gaming so stressful on so many levels. So it's kind of, a, it's interesting. I mean, and I'm, I'm really enjoying that. People can get the details if they just go to my Twitter page on that. So I'm very much plugged into it uh, again and uh, I, I, I'm loving it. Excellent. The book is Games Master, The Oral History, published by Thames and Hudson. A uh, friend of the show, Darren Wall, we should give him a shout out as well um, over the years. He's, they, he's produced some great books over there. Uh, Bitmap Brothers book, the Sensible Software one's an absolute favorite of mine as well. Uh, you can pick it up where books are sold pretty much everywhere. Uh, my physical copy never d arrived, so I was reading a PDF for the past two weeks, uh, but it probably goes to a testament to the quality of the book that I, I, I sat through scrolling on my PC to uh, lap it all up. Dominic, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Danny.